Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Sharif, and today we are going to start a new video about design of shear reinforcement and reinforced concrete beams. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you in uh, the concrete design course. It was a long time since I did my last videos about reinforced concrete, and I'm coming back now with uh, uh, design for shear and reinforced concrete beams. Uh, within this video, we'll be learning how to design for uh, shear reinforcement, which are stirrups or links, and how to get all requirements uh, from the code. Uh, as you know, loads on beams, we have uh, to result in some shear forces and also like bending moments. Okay, the shear force will result in shear stresses. As, as you can see here, this is a reaction and then you will have a shear force here. The shear stresses, this is the shear stress distribution in the cross section. And for the bending moments, will result in some tensile forces and compression forces on the cross section, which will be compression at the top and at the middle of the beam and tension at the bottom part of the middle of the beam. We had like several videos about designing for bending moment and within this video, we'll be learning how to design for shear. Uh, shear failure is very brittle failure compared to uh, the flexural failure. So when we design, we have to uh, prevent any shear failure when we design for uh, beams and uh, because it is a very blatant failure. So when you design uh, a beam, you want this beam to fail in flexural before it fails in uh, shear. So you need the flexural capacity of the beam to be greater than the uh, shear capacity of the uh, beam. So the shear strength should be greater than the flexural uh, strength and uh, shear is resisted by two things like concrete and shear reinforcement and usually the shear reinforcement will be stirrups or links. So if we have a beam like this under two concentrated loads, simply supported beam, and then uh, we draw the shear and the moment. So this will be the shear force diagram. You have this part, it will be with a shear uh, force, shear span, we call it shear span because we have the shear force. At the middle part, if the loads are symmetric, there is no shear force and then you have and again a shear force at the end of the beam for the bending moment this is showing the bending moment diagram the positive moment and therefore let's draw the beam and see how it will be the stresses and the cracking due to the combination of shear and bending moment so if we have a beam like this one and if we take a small section of the beam here at this middle part you will see that at this middle section of the beam, we have only bending moment, no shear forces at all in the middle part of the beam. So the shear, the bending moment here will result in tensile forces at the bottom of the beam. This will result in a tension force. And as you know, the concrete is weak in tension. Therefore, if we have a crack, the crack will be perpendicular to the tension force. And therefore, this will be the crack. Let's repeat this again, but we'll take another section, which is close to the end, this is mainly be subjected to shear forces and the moment is almost zero at this point. Let's see also how much it will be the stresses here. First of all, we will have a shear force in the vertical direction from left side going up and therefore we will have a shear in the uh, going down from the right direction and also we'll have horizontal shear. The two heads will be the same direction and two heads here will be same direction and therefore at the end you will have a diagonal tension force we call it diagonal because it's a diagonal direction so i have diagonal tension force going from this point and also out from the other uh, side here and therefore if we have a crack here the crack will be perpendicular to the uh, inside stresses or the diagonal tension and therefore in this case the crack will be at a 45 degree so at the middle part of the beer the beam which is uh, subject to only bending moment the cracks will be vertical cracks and at the end of the beam we expect to have uh, a diagonal crack at about 45 degrees in between if you have a section here at the middle like the shear span where you have a uh, shear force and also you have a bending moment so therefore you will have tension due to bending moment and then also you have some shear stresses and the resultant will be from this force and that force it will be something in between so this will be the resultant or 
the principal tensile stresses. And here is the principal tensile stresses coming from combination between shear stresses and bending moment, uh, or stresses coming from the bending moment. And therefore, any crack here will be perpendicular to the tension force, and therefore, this will be the crack. So you can see that the crack at the middle part is almost vertical. And starting when you go to the support, it will start getting inclined more and more until it will be about 45 degrees at the support because here it is only shear force and at the middle part it's only a tension force. This can be summarized in the principal tension stresses of the beam. This is showing the principal tension stresses and therefore any uh, crack will be perpendicular to the uh, principal ten tension stresses at the middle part you can see here like the it is almost uh, horizontal so perpendicular to this will give us a vertical crack at the middle part when you go close to the support start to get inclined more inclined more inclined as, as you can see here it is almost perpendicular to the principal tensile stresses and this is showing the cracks in a reinforced concrete beam under flexure and shear stresses so they are always perpendicular to the principal tension stresses let's now move to the average shear stress okay the experimental results showed that the shear failure usually occur at a diagonal plane uh, plan of 45 degrees so if we have a shear failure here uh, we can assume that it will be at a 45 degrees so if this distance here from the compression side to the center of the tension steel is distance D, which is the same D here, the shear plan will be here at uh, uh, inclined at 45 degrees. Therefore, the distance here will be D square root of 2. So if this is D and this is 45, the distance here will be D square root of 2. And at this uh, plane here uh, we have some stresses the stresses are we called it shear stresses diagonal tension stresses it's called v small this is applied on this lens and the width of the beam so it is like if we have uh, we draw it at the 3d you will have the lens here is d square root of 2 and the width is the b and therefore the surface area over which is the diagonal tension stress acts equals B times inclined distance here, which is D square root of 2. Now let's consider that we cut the beam at this uh, section and we'll take only part of the beam. So we have, if you have forces here V and V, the reactions will be also V and V and you will have some uh, diagonal tension stresses here we can get the resultant of these stresses will be called t capital now let's only take half of part of the beam which is this one and let's get how much it will be this diagonal tension force diagonal tension force equals the diagonal tension stresses multiplied by the area here which is the distance which is this distance d square root of 2 multiplied by the width of the beam which is b so therefore the diagonal tension force equal the stress multiplied by width of the beam multiplied by the length here which is d square root of 2 now let's make equilibrium in the vertical direction so we'll say v equal to t cosine 45 so let's do that v minus t cosine 45 which is t divided by square root of 2 equals 0. Now, the t is already this value here. We can take it and put it here. It is v small b d square root of 2 divided by square root of 2. So this square root will be eliminated, and the result will be v b d. Therefore, the shear force, which is this one, equals shear stress or diagonal tension stress multiplied by b multiplied by d which is the cross section from here rearrange the equation we can get the shear stress or the average shear stress will be equal to the shear force divided by bd and this is our important equation here that shear stresses or average shear stresses in the cross section equals shear force divided by bd and this will be the basic or the beginning for designing for shear so the shear stress 
uh, equals shear force divided by BD. And uh, the code is saying that this shear stress shouldn't exceed something called V max or maximum shear stress. How much is the maximum shear stress? The maximum shear stress is the minimum of two values, 0.8 square root of FCU or five Newton per millimeter square. So we should ensure when we calculate the maximum shear stress in the beam that it will not exceed these two values, five or 0.8 square root of FCU. But a question here, what is going to happen if we found that the V small here or the shear stress is greater than V max? In this case, the uh, section of the beam is not enough. We cannot, uh, cannot resist the shear stresses and we have to enlarge section dimension. So in this case, you have to increase B or D or increasing both of them to reduce the shear stress. And therefore, you it will be less than the V max. So this is the first thing to do is to check that your shear stress is less than V max. If it is less than V max, we can go forward and we can get something called VC, which is the shear stress carried by the concrete. Shear stress carried by the concrete from where we can get this this shear stress we can get it from this equation in the bs code it is 0.79 divided by gamma m which is the material safety factor material safety factor for uh, concrete and shear is 1.25 multiplied by this value 100 as over bd to power 1 over 3 multiplied by 400 over d to power 1 over 4. b and d this is the cross section which is b is the width and d is the effective depth Area steel here is the area of longitudinal tension steel at the section where you calculate the shear. So the area of longitudinal tension steel, not the compression steel, it is only the tension steel at the uh, section where you cal are calculating the shear. 400 over D, and D again is the effective depth. But we have here some conditions that the first part here, 100 AS over D, BD is should be less than or equals to three. So if it is greater than three, just take it as three. The maximum value here is three. So if you have 100 AS over BD is one or 1.5 or 1.2, it's okay. You can take it. But if it is greater than three, the maximum allowable value is three. So in this case, you take it as three. The second part, which is 400 over D, this one should be greater than or, or equal to one. So if it is greater than one, it's fine. Take it as one or one. If it's 1.2, take it 1.2, 1.5, take it 1.5. But if the 400 over D is less than one, so we take the value of one. So the minimum here is one and the maximum here is three. The last point here to mention is this equation, it was done for concrete strength less than or equal to 25 megapascal. So if you have the concrete strength FCU is greater than 25 megapascal, we have to multiply this value by another factor, which is FCU divided by 25 to power one over three. So if you want to get the final value of VC, it will be equal to this part, multiply it by FCU divided by 25 to power one over three. And this is if the concrete compressive strength is greater than 25 megapascal. So by doing that, we can get the shear stress carried by the concrete. This concrete uh, or shear stress carried by the concrete, VC is developed or develops from three main sources. The first one, the concrete compressive strength itself. If you have a higher concrete compressive strength, of course, it will uh, increase the VC and also the aggregate interlock. As you can see here, like this is if we have a shear crack, it is not a smooth crack. Usually it is rough and it is difficult to uh, move this one section from the other section. So because we have uh, aggregates here and this aggregate interlock will uh, enhance the shear carried by the concrete or will enhance the V. C value. So this is another factor called aggregate interlock will affect the value of VC. And the third factor is the dual action of the longitudinal uh, tension reinforcement. You can see here, if we have a shear crack, it wants to open, but the presence of uh, tension steel reinforcement will prevent the crack from getting wider and therefore the VC also will increase. So the shear stresses uh, carried by the concrete is affected by these three factors, concrete compressive strength, aggregate interlock, and the dual action of the longitudinal reinforcement. Let's move forward and uh, talk about shear reinforcement. 
the shear reinforcement in beams are usually like can come in one of the following two uh, ways. It could be stirrups or links, okay, or it could be stirrups plus bent bars. For the stirrups, they are like vertical uh, steel uh, members, it's like a closed stirrups, okay. In the uh, elevation, they will look like only like one like lines, but in the cross section, they will be like as a rectangle. And we'll see this within a few minutes. And the second case, you can add stirrups plus bent bars. So these are the stirrups, the vertical. And for some of the longitudinal bars, you can bend them like that. And they will help to resist the shear stresses close to the support. So you are allowed to use only stirrups or links. Or you can use combination of links plus bent bars. You cannot use only bent bars without links because the links are uh, anyway required. At least 50% of the stresses, shear stress should be carried by the links and the other 50 or less can be carried by bent bars if you decided to go with the bent bars. Mm -hmm. Now it is important to provide minimum uh, shear reinforcement to minimize the thermal and shrinkage cracking. So the code is requiring similar to the minimum reinforcement for longitudinal bars. Also, we should have minimum reinforcement for uh, shear uh, reinforcement. The minimum links or stirrups are specified in the code to resist a shear stress of 0.4 Newton per millimeter square. So the, the minimum uh, shear reinforcement will resist a shear stress of 0.4 Newton per millimeter square or megapascal. And of course, the VC uh, will take its part also because part of the shear stresses will be carried also by the concrete. So the shear stresses is shared by concrete and some uh, links or stirrups. And in this case, if we have minimum, the minimum will be 0.4 Newton per millimeter square. And how to get the area of minimum links? Okay, we can get it from this equation. ASV should be greater than or equal to 0.4 BVSV divided by 0.95 FYV. What are these values? ASV is the area of the links or the stirrups. If we take a cross section in this beam, this is the link here. Okay, this rectangle is the link. So the ASV is the submission of this leg and this leg. So here we have two legs. So the ASCV will be half here and half here. So this part is ASCV over two and this part is ASCV over two. So the total ASCV will be the area of one bar here multiplied by two because you have two bars. So this ASCV is the submission of the area of the uh, total legs of the stirrups. Here we have two legs. Uh, so it will be the area of this bar and the area of the bar here. Usually if we are using like diameter of uh, eight millimeter links and the area of the bar is about 50, so the total will be about 100 millimeter square. And of course, if you increase the diameter of the link, you increase the ACV. Now, what is BV and SV? BV is the uh, width of the cross section. Width here is BV. SV is the distance between the stirrup and another stirrup. The distance between links, we call them SV. And all of that will be divided by 0.95 FYV. What is FYV? The yield strength of the steel used for stirrups. Sometimes you use different steel for longitudinal bars and another steel in the, for the stirrups. So just to specify the FYV, if this is the yield stress or yield strength of the stirrups. Sometimes it could be the same material as the longitudinal bar, so it could be also the same. Now, within this equation, we have two unknowns. BV and FYV, they are known. So ASV, this depends on the diameter of the length. So we don't know the diameter. We need to design which diameter we will use. We will use 8 or 10 or 12 millimeter. And also the spacing between stirrups. We don't know also the spacing between stirrups. And when you have something like that and you have uh, an equation with two unknowns, so we can assume one and get the other. Usually, we can assume the diameter of the link. Once we have the diameter, we can get the ASV, the area of the two legs. So the ASV will be known, and the only unknown in this case will be the spacing. When you increase the diameter, the spacing also will increase. When you decrease the diameter, the ASV will decrease, and also the spacing will decrease. 
Uh, in members of minor importance, such as lentil beams or where V is less than 0.5 VC, links may be omitted. So if you have a lentil beam, which is like not important beam above windows or above doors, uh, and VC is very low, less than half of the VC, in this case, you may not use stirrups. Otherwise, you should use at least minimum stirrups in all important uh, elements or whenever the V is greater than half of the VC. According to the BS code also, design links are required when the V is greater than VC plus 0.4 because we said this 0.4 when is already covered by the minimum links. So if the shear stress is greater than shear carried by the concrete plus 0.4, in this case, we need to design or links which will be more than the minimum. In this case, we can get the area of the stirrups or the details of the stirrups using this equation, ASV equal BVSV multiplied by V minus VC divided by 0.95 FYV. V minus VC in this case will be greater than 0.4 if you take it the other side. So V minus VC in this case should be greater than 0.4 and therefore it is more than the minimum links. So from this equation, everything we know again, ASCV is the area which is unknown at the beginning. SCV also is unknown. Others are known for us. So we assume the ASCV and we get the spacing between links as in the previous case. And the value of V here is the shear stress at the shear critical section. Where is the shear critical section? We'll talk about this within a few minutes. But usually it is at a distance D from the face of the support. We sometimes we call it VD. So the shear stress that we use it for the design of the stirrup is the shear stress at the critical section, which is at distance D at the effective depth distance from the face of the support. And we will see this in uh, our examples. Some notes here also, like this figure shows or summarize all the design uh, requirements of shear or, or, or links by uh, the BS code. We can see here at the horizontal axis, this is the shear stress, and the vertical axis is the area of the required shear reinforcement. And we have like at 0.5 VC, less than 0.5 VC, if the shear stress is less than 0.5 VC, this part here, no links required in members of minor importance. From 0.5 VC to VC plus 0.4, we use minimum links. Okay, minimum links are required and we get them from this equation, which we just showed a few minutes ago. And if the shear stress is greater than VC plus 0.4, you can see that the area of shear reinforcement will increase as the shear will increase here. And we can get this from the last equation that we show in the previous slide. So this is summarizes the uh, values. If we have minimum, so it will use this equation. And in this case, VC will be between 0.5 VC and VC plus 0.4. If the V is greater than VC plus 0.4, so we have to use the second equation to design for links. Uh, shear critical section. Uh, the shear critical section, we have two sections. If you want to check for Vmax to compare the shear stress uh, again, it's the Vmax. So we take the critical section in this case will be at the face of the support. So we calculate the shear stress here and we compare it to the Vmax, which is the minimum of 5 or 0.8 square root FCU. And if you want to design for stirrups or design of the stirrups, the critical section will be at a distance D from the face of the support. What is D? The D is the effective depth so from the compression side to the center line of tension steel. So we have to calculate the shear force here, and then we calculate the shear stresses at distance D, and then we use it to design for the stirrups. The last thing to show in uh, this video is about maximum spacing between stirrups. These are the links or the stirrups. The maximum spacing here, which is SV, it should be less than or equal to 0.75 D. So the maximum is 0.75 D, 75% or 3 over 4 of the effective depth of the beam. The spacing should be less than or equal to that value. So if you get a spacing more than 0.75 D, you should reduce it to 0.75 D. Uh, that's it for the video. And just follow me in the coming video to see how to design or how to apply these regulations 
or what we have learned in this video and solving uh, real examples and design for the links for those examples. Thank you for watching and looking uh, forward to see you in a coming video. If you like the video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with others. Thank you and goodbye.